Today we're going to be taking a look at hyperparathyroidism, which is a condition that involves excess levels of parathyroid hormone in the blood. The best place to start with this topic is by first understanding the basic anatomy and physiology of the parathyroid gland. And if you remember, we have four parathyroid glands in total usually, which sit on the posterior aspect of the thyroid gland, with one of them being labelled here. Now when there's low levels of calcium in the blood, or high levels of phosphate, it triggers the parathyroid gland to start secreting PTH, or parathyroid hormone, into the blood. This PTH then helps to restore the balance and increase levels of calcium and decrease levels of phosphate. And this entire process is governed by a negative feedback loop. So as the levels of calcium increase, the levels of parathyroid hormone should decrease, and this helps to keep the whole system in check. You can see that the overall effect is therefore to increase serum calcium levels and decrease serum phosphate. And we'll now take a closer look at how exactly this is achieved. Parathyroid hormone acts upon different systems in the body to achieve its effects on calcium and phosphate. And the first system it acts upon is the kidneys or the renal system. If you take a closer look, we can see that parathyroid hormone binds to its receptors in the distal convoluted tubule or the collecting ducts, which increases the movement of calcium back into the blood from the ducts. At the same time, PTH restricts the movement of phosphate back into the blood, so in other words it decreases phosphate reabsorption. The overall effect of this is therefore to increase renal calcium reabsorption and increase phosphate excretion into the urine. The second system which PTH acts upon is the gastrointestinal system. And there's one enzyme in particular called 1-alpha-hydroxylase. When PTH binds to this enzyme, it activates it. And the enzyme helps to catalyze the reaction from an inactive form of vitamin D to the active form of vitamin D. The increase in the amount of active vitamin D helps to retain more calcium in the gut and increase intestinal calcium reabsorption. The final system which parathyroid hormone acts upon is the skeletal system. And the way this works is that PTH helps to increase osteoclast activity. And these osteoclasts are basically enzymes which lead to bone resorption, allowing more calcium to be released into the bloodstream. Combining all of these effects together, you can see that they lead to increases in calcium and decreases in phosphate. Let's now take a look at the first type of pathology, which would be a primary hyperparathyroidism. And the most common cause behind this would be an overgrowth of one of the parathyroid glands. And this is usually a parathyroid adenoma. In this example, the adenoma would begin to secrete excess levels of parathyroid hormone into the blood. And this excess basically exaggerates all of the functions which we described on the previous slide. So for instance, we would get increased calcium reabsorption and phosphate excretion in the kidneys. We would get overactivation of vitamin D and intestinal calcium reabsorption, and it would cause excess osteoclast activation, resulting in increased bone resorption. With all of these processes, the overall effect would be a high PTH level, as more is being secreted by the adenoma, a high calcium level, and a low serum phosphate. Turning towards secondary hyperparathyroidism, in this condition, there are underlying diseases such as chronic kidney disease, or vitamin D deficiency, which leads to reduction in the level of calcium reabsorption back into the blood from either the kidneys or the GI system. Similar to the normal process, this low level of calcium triggers the parathyroid gland to secrete more PTH into the blood in an attempt to increase the levels. And this PTH acts on the osteoclasts, the kidneys, and the gut in an attempt to increase the calcium levels. And this does work up to an extent. However, the reason why the calcium levels often remain low despite this is because there is an underlying impairment. So for example, the kidneys can't reabsorb as well as they do in normal individuals, and the gut can't absorb as well as compared with normal because of the deficiency. In some instances, the levels of calcium may return to normal given enough time, but the condition does not lead to hypercalcemia, which is where there's too much calcium. Notably, in the case of chronic kidney disease, the levels of phosphate are also increased, and this is because the kidneys are not able to excrete as well as they normally do. Based on all of this, 
the overall findings in secondary hyperparathyroidism are a high PTH level, a normal or low calcium, and a high serum phosphate. Where it starts to get slightly more complex is tertiary hyperparathyroidism, which is basically when secondary hyperparathyroidism has been going on for an extensive amount of time. What happens in this case is that the parathyroid glands actually undergo hyperplasia, so they become larger in an attempt to return the calcium back to normal levels. This hyperplasia results in an extensive increase in the amount of parathyroid hormone being produced. And this basically forces the systems, even some of the impaired ones, to increase calcium reabsorption. However, because of this hyperplasia, there's actually a lack of negative feedback from the glands to the calcium, and it basically becomes uncontrollable. In some instances, even after you correct the deficiency or the impairment, so for example, correcting the chronic kidney disease with a renal transplant, or correcting the vitamin D deficiency by replacing it, this cycle actually continues because the system has become so autonomous and the hypercalcema therefore persists. So in tertiary hyperparathyroidism, the overall effect would be a high PTH level, a high calcium level, and a high serum phosphate. In terms of the diagnosis for hyperparathyroidism, the first step is usually biochemistry tests, which involve measuring the levels of PTH, calcium, and phosphate to determine which type of hyperparathyroidism is present. In some instances, patients can also undergo ultrasound or nuclear scintigraphy, which helps to identify regions where parathyroid activity is increased. DEXA scans can also help to confirm the diagnosis. Turning towards the signs and symptoms of the condition, both primary and tertiary hyperparathyroidism lead to increased levels of calcium in the blood. So you would get the classic symptoms of hypercalcemia, which include renal stones, gastrointestinal symptoms, and possible psychiatric mood changes. All three of the hyperparathyroidism diseases also lead to additional symptoms, including bone pain or osteolysis due to increased osteoclast activity, muscle weakness, and generalized fatigue. In some instances, patients may actually be asymptomatic with the condition. The management of hyperparathyroidism usually depends on the type which is present. So for example, with primary hyperparathyroidism, surgical resection of the adenoma should cure the condition. In secondary hyperparathyroidism, it's important to treat the underlying cause. So for example, chronic kidney disease can be treated with medications or definitively a renal transplant, and vitamin D deficiency can be corrected by replacing the deficient vitamins. Tertiary hyperparathyroidism is a bit more complex to treat, but usually involves some level of parathyroid surgery. This surgery aims to reduce the levels of hyperplasia in the parathyroid glands, and this helps to return PTH levels back within a normal range. And here we have a quick summary slide outlining everything we've gone through in the video. I hope you found this helpful, and I'll see you in the next one.